When I say social media platforms and democracy, what comes to mind? Massive risk. When you say social media platforms and democracy, the word that comes to mind is harm. It comes to my mind, freedom. And what do you not want this documentary to be about? Scapegoats. Fake news. I'd like there not to be just problems and hate. I'd like a bit of hope too. The promise of social media when I was growing up was everything. It was the world. It was exploration. It was discovery. It was creativity. It was feeling like I had finally found my people. And what do you feel like social media has become now? I feel like social media has become a marketplace for pain and bad experiences. The rise of social media networks with content promotion algorithms that maximize on the basis of engagement, they have had really profound effects on wider society that are harming all of us. So we do a lot of work uh, domestically here in the United States, but you know, if you look at a platform like Facebook, for instance, I hate to say this, but the version of Facebook that I log on to here in the United States is actually the best they have to offer. The U.S. thinks that their side of the internet is the most messed up sides of the, of the social media landscape. But the truth is they're actually getting the platinum version. They're the ones getting the champagne in the club, right? We are the ones getting the moonshine. Out of very many countries that have tried to use a disinformation apparatus to sway opinions, Kenya has actually been the canary in the coal mine. Kenya is one of the countries, not just in Africa, but in the world, that has very clearly shown an appetite for disinformation campaigns going almost 10 years now. And this happened in 2013, this happened in 2017, and it is likely that it's gonna happen again today. So, if you wanted to tell someone how to manipulate an election, what would you tell them to do? Uh, we've seen it in history. You find your target groups and then you explain why they're the reason you don't have enough and why it's not uh, the government not working well or the elite, it's that target community. And right now, immigrants are that target community. And in France, I'd say the Muslim community is that one. Ils sont, ils sont voleurs, ils sont assassins, ils sont violeurs, c'est tout ce qu'ils sont. Il faut les renvoyer. Attendez. Okay, so why do we care about Eric Zemmour? He was really the person that had the digital strategy that worked. There's several techniques he's used. There's the astroturfing. Le Monde, the French newspaper, published an investigation about how a small but very uh, dedicated team managed to coordinate a massive retweets, which meant that he was trending on Twitter more than other candidates, saying controversial, outrageous things like, uh, for example, we're going to get all the immigrants out of France and we're going to ban um, essentially Muslim sounding names. Suddenly these were the topics that were being di discussed and it seemed like he was the person everyone wanted to talk about when actually it was very coordinated. Various platforms have different versions of these algorithms to be able to amplify content. TikTok has its For You page, Facebook has its newsfeed, but in particular, one of the things that we have seen disinformation um, operators have very much been able to figure out is how to manipulate Twitter's trending algorithm. And this is because it's actually quite easy for them to do it. Trending on Twitter by itself is not gonna win an election, but being in the conversation is why he was so dangerous. Yeah, so a lot of people ask, you know, why are people susceptible to misinformation or disinformation? Um, there's various theories about that. Uh, one example is what we call illusory truth. So the idea of illusory truth is that the more often a statement is repeated, the more likely people are to think that that's true. Your brain mistakes what we call fluency uh, for truth. This algorithm has the potential to be able to amplify pieces of content that perhaps would not have gotten uh, as much attention as they would if it did not exist. Uh, is it human nature to be drawn to divisive content or is that something social networks have created? Okay, let me, let me think of it. That's a, that's a deep question. Let me, <laughs> let me think about that for a second. Um, in one, 
rather unethical experiment, Facebook actually showed that they can manipulate the emotional sentiment in people's feed by filtering the amount of positive or negative news that people are exposed to. And so they actually have the power to shift people's emotions and, and how they feel about content on the platform. And so I think that should get us thinking about um, how online engagement uh, makes us feel and how that then directs our behavior, both online and, and offline. We are living through a new form of censorship and harassment in Brazil, outsourced to armies of patriotic trolls and amplified by bots on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp. My name is Patricia Campos Mello. I am an investigative journalist from Brazil and I cover, among other things, disinformation campaigns. If you're a woman and you were a journalist in Brazil, uh, of course, you're gonna endure a lot of, you know, toxic attacks online. And all those attacks, they're even worse if you are a black woman or if you're a member of the LGBTQ community. I could kind of name and cite here more than five examples of people who are activists. And just because they wrote something on Twitter, they got threat because of this. When you come to talk to a black woman who is an activist, for example, in the favela, she's gonna say the same thing. Like, I don't put my life out there because I'm scared of the next day someone's gonna come here, you know, and do something. There are very few women in positions of power in Brazil, very few women uh, legislators, and even fewer who are uh, both women and, and black. So it's particularly tragic that uh, we lost Marielle, that she was assassinated. I'm Marielle Franco Sisters, and I've been an activist since 16 years old, and I became this voice for many black women in Brazil after they have killed my sister. In the Institute, we believe that we don't need to wait for black women to be dead, to be a protagonist, you know, but we have to look out the other women who are here. This year specifically, we are talking about this digital security for candidates, especially for black women. We are working to give visibility to these women who, you know, are afraid of being killed or of being threatened or something because they are against Bolsonaro. Basically, we have no idea of um, how many people uh, social media platforms have to uh, moderate in Portuguese. How many people do they have who speak Portuguese, who can be uh, people who are trying to monitor what's being said, if there's, you know, hate speech. And we've learned from several whistleblowers that you know, it's not a priority. On Facebook, for example, only 13% of the total hours that are spent moderating content are used to moderate content outside North America. Yet 90% of the users are outside North America. It's, it's the real awful truth is that for all that there are some genuinely brilliant researchers in this field and a huge amount of effort going into it, we fundamentally don't know enough about what's going on to diagnose the problem. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, I'm a cybersecurity researcher specifically, and I ran one of the largest programs for, for collecting the data that Facebook provides and then identifying misinformation and harmful content and reporting it back to Facebook. However, early in that process, Facebook sent me a cease and desist letter asking that some of our research programs be switched off, which we are not willing to do. We are sort of of the mind that Facebook doesn't get to veto independent research about the platform. And so unfortunately, in August of 2021, uh, Facebook terminated my account and the accounts of other people connected with my project and cut off our access to, uh, to data that they make available to the public in, at large. You can't build a car without crashing against a wall. You can't pump water around without having it tested for pollutants. But you can build algorithms that shape what billions of people can see and share without ever showing anybody what the consequences of your decisions are. We deserve to know what happens at these platforms that, sh that 
have such a big part in shaping our democracy, our elections, um, how we show up in the world. At a minimum, people should understand how decisions get made, how decisions get enforced or not enforced. And so one of the things that we always really call for is transparency and consistency in terms of how platforms are being moderated or managed. Uh, my name is Brandon Silverman, and I was the CEO and one of the co-founders of a startup called CrowdTangle. And we were a social analytics tool that made it easy to see what was happening on social media. Uh, we were acquired by Facebook in 2016, and I was there up until about a year ago. And one of the things that we kind of became over the course of our time at Facebook was one of the main ways that they were transparent with the outside world about what was happening on the platform. I think it is a real shame that Facebook, from all reports, is, is letting CrowdTangle die on the vine because it is something that has enabled a lot of reporting about the platform itself and about how the biggest content creators and the biggest spreaders of misinformation use the platform. There's so few other tools like this. <laughs> Uh, available out there for researchers. You want to study fake news on Twitter? Uh, we need to have access to how information has been spreading on Twitter from, from its inception uh, to present day. And uh, at the same time, we don't want to compromise anyone's right to privacy of their data, but we can use with aggregated, anonymized data set. Because at the moment, it's so difficult for us to make firm causal conclusions about any of the questions that we've been talking about uh, in this interview, really, uh, is because we don't have all the data at hand. For those of us who are trying to fix this problem with them, um, they, we need to help them realize that they cannot do this alone. If you have intentionally built a platform that hosts a huge percentage of the world's civic and political discourse, then you have a responsibility to try to make it as open as possible. This black box needs to be opened. It does not matter whether they are private companies. They need to be transparent about their operations. I think that we need to have a complete reimagining of ourselves as users of social media. Social media platforms would be nothing without us, yet they are able to operate as if they don't have to be accountable to us. And so I believe that we deserve openness from platforms that would not exist without us.